Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your weekly update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim. Today, we'll talk about immigrant children's rights, rights with guests. Maria Wolchen, Executive Director of the Young Center for Immigrant Children's Rights, and Francis Pontes Peebles, a board member for the Young Center of, uh, for Immigrant Children's Rights. It's great to have you both here. We actually had the pleasure of interviewing your program director, Gladys mm -hmm. Molina Alt, three yeah. months ago, prior to the presidential election. And of course, now the, the government has changed. There are new priorities. There are uh, announced uh, emphasis on uh, immigration reform, which is long past due and has been pursued by multiple administrations from multiple parties. Uh, let's talk about children first and your, um, and your efforts to try and help those children who are immigrants. And then we can, we can uh, broaden the discussion. Maria, could you just give us uh, a grounding in the work that your organization does? Sure, I'd be happy to. And thank you so much for having us here this morning, Mark. It's really our pleasure. Um, so the Young Center for Immigrant Children's Rights, um, you know, we essentially have two pro programs. One is our child advocate program, which Gladys Molina Alt talked about. We advocate for the best interests of unaccompanied children. We have offices in eight locations around the country. So we advocate on getting kids out of custody, family reunification, and the ultimate decision about whether um, a child should remain in the United States. And of course, though, the children's wishes are paramount. Um, and then we also have a policy division, which essentially takes the issues that we see on the ground with kids while we're serving as child advocates and, and use, you know, use, use that to direct our national advocacy at the federal level, both um, on the Hill and also um, with the federal agencies to, you know, to make the system more child appropriate, which, which it has not been. And the important thing about unaccompanied children in particular is that they have no other representation. There's no family here that is accessible. Very often there are language barriers, right? Kids are afraid, kids are insecure. Um, and, and so you are taking a role that is so unique and so important to that child's peace of mind, right? That it, 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 it brings with it different dimensions than, than supporting uh, immigrants who are adults, doesn't it? Yeah, children are completely different. And one of the examples I give is if you can imagine a child, let's say he's uh, 12 years old and he's, he's been released from custody and he has a court hearing coming up and he has to find that federal court. He has to go into that building and find the courtroom. He has to walk into that courtroom. He doesn't speak English and figure out what's going on. And, and it's impossible for a child. It's very difficult for adults, but it's, uh, it's really difficult for kids. I mean, I get nervous walking into a courtroom if I don't know the judge. So you can imagine how a child feels walking in there. And they, our role, I mean, so there are attorneys who, um, through nonprofits who help the kids through the process, but our role is different. Our role is best interest. And we also stay on the case from the moment we meet the children while they're in immigration detention all the way through uh, and continuing after they're released from custody. And our role is really arguing for their safety. And that's different from adults. Um, we're arguing for their safety because they're children and because they, they are unique because they're children and distinct from adults. And the biggest problem being that the system was intended for adults and not for children. It's a major gap. Um, Francis, how did you get involved as, involved as a board member? Because you can spend your volunteer time in a number of different ways. Why this particular issue? Why, why did that connect with your heart? Um, well, I had heard amazing things about the Young Center um, from another board member who was a friend of mine, and she's an immigration attorney now turned chaplain. Um, and she um, asked me to help to participate. I think as a mother, it was very important to me um, as a bicultural person. I came to the United States from Brazil when I was four years old. 
um, that really struck a nerve. Um, and also just uh, as a human being, you know, when I, when I think about an unaccompanied child uh, coming to our doorstep essentially and asking for help, uh, what is our responsibility to that child? Um, and how can we best help that child uh, that's not in a, in a law enforcement stance or a criminalization stance, but in a stance of, of being humanitarians? Um, so that was really um, important to me uh, when I decided to join this organization. And they do such an amazing job. They're actually the only nonprofit that has child advocates that go in and visit um, children in detention and they visit them weekly and they give them kind of a connection. Um, they give them human bonds and also advocate for these children and for the best interests of these children, which no one is doing in this system. Do, do you in a, in a sense see yourself uh, when you see these children? Had you not had parents around you? Had you not had the support around you? I mean, my situation is every, every situation I think when it comes to coming to this country is unique. And that's what makes immigration so complex. Um, my father was an American citizen, so we, we didn't have that barrier. Um, of course, as a writer, I immediately feel my empathy drawn to these children. Um, and, and as a mother, I, ultimately, what's interesting is I don't think of, of them as if I were in their shoes, I think of their parents. I think of as a mother, if I was in such a dire situation, um, you know, no, 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 one, no one wants to leave their home, the place where they grow up, their place where they have their culture and their friends and their neighbors, unless something truly dire is happening for them to have to cross so many borders and go through so much hardship to finally come to our border. And imagine doing that alone as a child. Um, and that, that really, um, it breaks my heart, but it also allows me to see, wow, how, amazing and courageous and resourceful these children are and how can we best help them so if anything i see them through a mother's eyes and want to to help them in that way what i find so interesting is that when you look at our media we tend to look at celebrities sports heroes political figures and so on and so forth but really it's common citizens like ourselves who are driving change and driving the, the nation um, in particular ways. Maria, when you build your team, how do you select individuals uh, who both have the competencies and the heart mm -hmm. to do the right thing for these children? Uh, because they are the leaders. They are the leaders of the nation in this, in this area, aren't they? Right. So, I mean, our, you know, our staff um, are, you know, come from a variety of of backgrounds, many of our staff are immigrants or the children of immigrants, and um, and and this issue is very personal. Um, we also um, do work. Uh, we recruit volunteers, and the way it works is they're the ones who go into the facilities and meet with the kids and learn their stories, and then we, as attorneys and social workers, um, do the strategy work and the advocacy work with that information, knowing, knowing, you know, what the child wants for themselves. And so, you know, the volunteers are also for the most part, um, well, they have to be bilingual, it's a requirement we need um, for them to be able to speak to the kids without an interpreter in the room or without a telephonic interpreter. And, um, but most of our volunteers are also, many of them are also bicultural and really, you know, that's important too, because that helps them to understand what these kids are, are going through. This is so important, right? The, the idea, and this is, this is something that we've embedded in, on the search side of, of our work, uh, and, and also in this, in this media work that we're doing, this idea of cultural competencies being an actual mm -hmm. competence, linguistic right. competencies being an actual professional competence, right? An understanding of, of uh, a different lived experiences because of your own uh, life. Um, and, and you're talking about knitting together a staff of different ethnicities, mm -hmm. right? Of different yeah. languages, of different sensibilities, of different capabilities, all to create this professional product 
So the, the, the question of, of diversity, inclusion, and, and, and these kinds of issues, it's kind of all baked in, isn't it? It is. And I will, I have to admit, though, that we, you know, we are working, you know, as many organizations are, we are imperfect. Um, you know, many of our staff are um, persons of color, but certainly not our whole staff. And we, you know, are very intentionally both within the organization and on the board working towards um, ensuring that we really are implementing, not just saying it, but that we're implementing the principles of diversity, equity, inclusion. In, in, you know, all organizations need to do that, but we're, our clients are children coming from all over the world. So it's really especially important that we, um, we do that. Francis, um, we got a, a, a question, a very interesting one. Um, it's kind of a more, more in the form of an assertion um, that, um, that the immigration system is, is broken by design. It's meant to be broken. Uh, it's meant to be, uh, to be dysfunctional. Um, as a volunteer, do you feel that America's immigration system is intentionally uh, broken? Um, I'm not sure if it's intentional or a product of lingering um, fear of the other that has been with us you know, for, for centuries, um, we, I, I think that the issue with our immigration system right now is twofold. I think the first is that it's based, it's so entangled with criminality. Um, and I think it needs to be more enmeshed with human rights and humanitarianism. So uh, let me just get this straight. So when you say entangled with criminality, you're saying that the, the idea of violation results in, a, a, in an identification of, of the person as being a criminal. Correct, as yes. To being somebody who is, um, who is a refugee or is fleeing some sort of situation that all of us would want to flee. So it's, it's, while, while laws have been broken, it's not a criminal act in your mind it's, it's, it belongs in a different category and should be treated differently. That's what, that's what you're basically saying. Yes, definitely. It's not I that think... these people are, are, are you know, bank robbers and drug dealers and, and so on and so forth, right? You're not gonna have a 12 year old uh, refugee who is uh, coming in uh, to knock over, you know, your, your local convenience store. Correct, yes. I think that for a long time, um, it's almost been, like a penal system, um, the immigration system. And what it needs to be is more of a social system where we, we help people, we un try to fact find instead of be suspicious. We try to understand why they're coming here, what they need, what they would need to succeed, or in a child's case, what's in that child's best interest? How can we help them? And sometimes in the, what's in that child's best interest is to go back to their home country. But if we don't act as kind of curious fact finders in a humane way, then we'll never know what's in their best interests. And so I do think that the immigration system is broken also because there's no separate system for children. Children are treated as adults in our immigration system right now, and children are not adults. And children need a different kind of care, and they need a different kind, especially children who come here alone, unaccompanied. Um, they need a, a completely different system. We have a child uh, system here in our, in our legal system. Why don't we have a, a system of immigration dedicated to children? So in that sense, I do think that we need kind of a reimagining of our immigration system um, and just a restructuring from the bottom to the top. Um, we just did a poll and, and it looks like 98% of the respondents feel that uh, there's, there's a considerable consensus that the immigration system is, is broken. Um, in terms of, of addressing some of the needs that we have now, uh, Maria, and how you train your people, we got a, a, um, a question from, from Erica about um, how you train your people to, to fill those gaps. And, and the specific question is whether the advocates are trained with a similar model as, as that of the, of the Gal and Casas. 
um, nationally. Um, how do you train your people uh, so that they can provide this, this service? And I'm sorry, just to clarify, do we train them similar to guardians ad litem? Is that the question? Yeah, exactly. exactly. Okay, got it. Um, so yes, we, I mean, our um, role is very similar to a guardian ad litem whose job it is to advocate for the best interests of the child. Um, we, we train our staff um, to be very careful not to impose their own views on the child. We're very careful not to be paternalistic about these kids. Um, but our role, and I, I can give you, you know, kind of the starkest example of a situation. It's very rare for us to go against what a child wants. But it, an example would be a child who comes into this country. He's 12 years old and he says, um, my entire family was killed. I know that if I go back, I'll be killed. So that child is eligible for the for protection in this country. His family was killed for political reasons. But now he's been in immigration custody, detention for eight months. And he goes to the lawyer and says, I can't take this anymore. I just, I just wanna go back to my home country. The lawyer tries to convince him not, um, but she can't. And so her job is to tell the immigration judge, my client wants to return to home country. And then the judge turns to us and says, Miss Molina or Ms. Wolch, what, you know, do you have anything to say? And we would tell the judge it's not in his best interest. It's not safe. His life will be at risk. And we can't just say it's dangerous um, in Honduras. We have to give very fact-based fact um, information about that child. And again, I mean, we rarely go against what the child wants, but in that situation, He's asking for that because he has what we call detention fatigue. He's just, he can't take being um, in custody any longer. Um, Wafa Kanan asked, how do, um, do these young people get into the United States um, in general? I, I know that you, you've done studies to see um, how, the, how people um, arrive here. Could you just sort of break up the cohorts of, 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 of those arrivals for us? Sure. I mean, today, most people are, most people, including most children, are arriving at our southern border, the U.S.-Mexico border. Um, they're traveling all different ways. I mean, we also, you know, we have most of the kids coming today are coming from Central America, Honduras, El Salvador, Guatemala. But we have kids coming from Somalia, Ghana, China, India. And today, most of them are also traveling through South America, Central America, and to the US-Mexico border. So the way it works is they arrive at the border and if things are working properly, um, they meet, there's a, a Customs and Border Patrol official who will ask them a series of questions. Um, and uh, for kids who are not from a contiguous country, so that's Mexico, they are taken into custody here in the United States and transferred to a different agency, it's Health and Human Services Office of Refugee Resettlement, and they have shelters around the country. So the kids are placed in the shelter. The minute they land there in the shelter, the people in the facility work to try to find family in the US. Some kids may have a parent here. Some kids have aunts, uncles, grandparents, siblings. And our um, policy and law is that kids can be released from custody to family. It does not mean they have permission to stay. They're still in deportation proceedings. But the idea behind it is it's not good for kids to be detained. So we want them to be released to family while they're going through this deportation proceeding. Can we talk a little bit about the, the uh, creative tension that exists between the governance body, the board, and the staff leadership? Because the, the board is, is there to support your work. It's there to fundraise uh, for you. But it's also there as a fiduciary to provide oversight um, and to hold you, Maria, accountable. So Francis, how do you hold uh, Maria's feet to the fire? And, as a group, and and, and um, are there are there situations where you've identified a need, and and you all have some difficult discussions about how to fulfill that need? Could you just talk about how governance works? Yeah, definitely. Um, I think that the people, Maria, especially, um, everyone at the Young Center is so passionate about what they do, um, so deeply caring, so talented 
um, that as a board, it's our job to uplift them and to give them the resources that they need um, to keep helping more children. And so ultimately we're all kind of rowing in the same direction. Um, and there, since I've been on the board, there really hasn't been a time when we haven't been rowing in the same direction. Um, and so I think that because there exists that deep care and passion in the staff and the lawyers and the child advocates um, and, and Maria sets that tone, um, you know, as a board, it makes our job of governance all that much easier. You know, we do have a lot of strategic planning. Um, of course, in the last four years, there's been um, a, a lot of shifts in terms of how do we react to these um, policies and going from proactive stance to more reactive stance in the last four years. Um, and so we've had a lot of discussions about that. Um, and a lot of discussions about growth. How do we grow? Where do we go in the future? Um, and you know, how do we even out, not even out, but how do we kind of grow our policy work? Um, not only the child advocate work, but kind of the global policy work. Um, but in terms of governance, you know, we are all working toward the same goal, which is helping more children and changing our immigration system to be more um, child, friendly. Um, so that's, that's our main role as a board. So, so governance is always in, in association with the mission. Yes. To add your skills and sensibilities and counsel uh, to, uh, to Maria's uh, staff role. Um, so there, there, there is, um, there's not a lot of tension in the system, but there is this intense focus uh, on that mission. And, and were there to be a deviation, you would actually, your role is to, is to bring people back to that center, right? Definitely. And I think the wonderful thing about our board is it's so diverse in so many ways. And so we not only have um, immigration attorneys, um, other kinds of attorneys, business people, a chaplain, artists like myself. Um, and so because we have all of these diverse voices, we also have um, someone who was an unaccompanied um, child uh, when they were a child. And so I think that kind of range of, of voices allows us as a board to really kind of enrich our conversations and to help us uh, stay on track with our mission. And, um, you know, I think Maria and, and everyone that works at the Young Center is an essential part of that. And so, yes, we always go back to that mission and so if there is ever tension, the tension is from the outside, you know, what, what are we going to do today and how do we react to this? Um, and we really try to stay united um, because that's the way that we can help more children. We, we've received a couple of questions along those lines. My father in Germany uh, asked um, about uh, uh, what the, um, how do you view the uh, progress that, that is being made now and is uh, planned going into the future in terms of the change of administration, in terms of, of th this whole issue that we all saw children being kept in, in uh, really terrible uh, situations in cages and such, and some of the uh, changes that you're seeing. Maria, uh, what, what do you anticipate is, uh, is going to be the policies and, and what has changed through executive orders very quickly? Sure, well, obviously we're very excited about the change in administration. Um, and as Francis mentioned, I mean, we have been in <laughs> mode for the last four years and now there's a real opportunity um, not to be in defensive mode and, and also not to return to what some people would consider normal, which is the way it was four years ago, but to make real progress. And what that means is, you know, it, developing, as Francis mentioned, a new system for kids that treats children like children. Um, and I will say that we, you know, we're very hopeful that we've met many of the people, uh, or we know some of the people on the transition committees. Um, we're very hopeful that these federal agencies will, will be more receptive under this new administration. And there already have been changes. Um, I mean, 
President Biden came in on a, and on his first day in office signed executive orders, you know, halting the building of the border wall. Um, what's really important is is pausing deportations for a hundred days because a lot of people who are slated for deportation are not they're not criminals. Um, they may not have status here in the United States, but they haven't done anything wrong. And so I think refocusing the the goals of our Department of Homeland Security, and, and I think that's the reason they've halted deportations for a hundred days is to step back and and really think about it. And then um, there's also the protections for dreamers, for young people eligible for DACA. I mean, they've just been living with, um, you know, a sword over their heads uh, for the last four years. And it's been back and forth and back and forth. And I think now we have a lot of hope that we will be able to pass legislation. I mean, uh, President Biden put in place an executive order, and the next step obviously will need to be legislation to protect these young people permanently. It seems that there's a lot of co uh, consensus and in, information. Our polls uh, bear this out. Now, of course, it's a select audience of people who are interested in this issue, but 98, 97% believe that immigrant children should be uh, treated differently uh, right. than adults, and a similar percentage um, believe that DACA. Uh, recipients, people who have grown up uh, from ch from childhood on only knowing this country should be welcomed as, as citizens and that should be a path to citizenship. Um, I, I, I think the really big question is how do we systemically um, adjust this system? Um, right now, it looks like it's, it's running on uh, goodwill and gap filling by nonprofits. Right. We received a question about um, the relationship between ORR, so Office of, uh, of Refugee Resettlement, um, case managers and your child advocates. There are a lot of staff that even when they, they must constrain uh, children in terrible conditions, they're, they're really trying to do the right thing within the constraints of their role. And it seems like there's, a, there's sort of a confluence of, of human interest here that really needs to be encapsulated in our laws and how we work systemically. Uh, what are the next changes that are going to be required to move from just human goodwill to systematic action? Yeah, I mean, I think what you're touching on is really important. Um, and I think it's going to require a lot of attention from the public. And you know, the example I would give is family separation. Um, there was just a consensus and a groundswell of attention to this. And it's the reason that the Trump administration stopped separating parents from children across the board. It is still happening in some instances, but it stopped. And that is what we need to happen now. It, it needs, we need more than the advocates speaking out. Um, and we need, we need the public to really understand what's going on and understand the importance of changing the system. And it is gonna be, it's, there are really good people at all levels of the system um, who are trying to do the right thing, but we, we need to change it. We need to change our regulations. We need to change the entire system. We need to welcome children. It's what we do in our child welfare systems, as Francis mentioned, we don't just shut the door and you know say go away in our child welfare system. So why is it that we would treat immigrant children any differently? Our job needs to be to make sure that the next place they're going, they're going to be safe, which is exactly the same way that we um, we intend to uh, care for our kids who end up in our U.S. child welfare systems. It's such a great point, Francis. We're coming to the end of our time, so I'm going to give you the last word. What is your wish and the wish of the board for uh, involvement of American citizens um, in support of, of children who are immigrants? How would you advise us all to think about this problem? I think we need to change the narrative about immigration in the sense of making it more of a humanitarian crisis rather than um, uh, a fear-based narrative. I also think that the, the public can help in so many ways um, 
mainly um, they can they can donate to nonprofits like the Young Center so that the Young Center can continue doing uh, its work. Um, they can write to their representatives. They can talk to their representatives. They can say, you know what, children need a separate immigration system. Why isn't this happening? This can easily happen. Uh, children need legal representation. They need a completely separate immigration system. Um, and the other thing is they can volunteer, not only with the Young Center, but there's so many organizations. Mm -hmm. um, they can be a child advocate and actually have a one-on-one -on -one relationship with these children. And that, in, by doing that, then talk about it in a way that changes the narrative. What we need is just a huge kind of cultural shift around immigration. And I think that the US and US citizens, US uh, people who live here in the United States are so creative and so empathic that we can do this. We can really make this change. Well, it, it, that's such a wonderful point, Francis. You know, there are so many different ways in which we can, as citizens, impact, beneficially impact uh, American civil society. Thank you so much for your service as a volunteer and a board member. Maria, great, great to see you. Thank you for sharing the work of the Young Center. Uh, that's the Nonprofit Report. Thank you all for attending. Thank you for your question. Everybody stay safe. That's the Nonprofit Report. Have a great day.